so you know the the rules. Um, Final questions addressing the entire panel or individual members, panelists can comment on each other um, and wait until the microphone arrives at your place. Uh, so my uh, question is for Mr. Jeffrey Tucker. Is there anything uh, left to be said for Hayek? <laughs> we're going to start the Civil War early here, right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, well, uh, yeah, I guess I, I'm sure, first of all, I should say that uh, I, I thought Hans's paper was br a brilliant invisceration of, of this aspect of Hayek and uh, absolutely necessary and, and, and fabulous. So, um, but yeah, there is, and I'm sure everybody else would, would, and Hans too would say there's another Hayek. And I've learned an enormous amount from, from Hayek. And the social theory in particular. I think Joe Salerno would, you know, highlight his business cycle theory. For me, uses of knowledge in society is a brilliant paper. It's a, it's a great expansion of, of, of Ms. Essie's idea. And, I, and uh, one thing that's really neat about Hayek, to me anyway, is that he doesn't have this sort of Hobbesian um, uh, problem that, that Mises has. You know, Mises always said all the time that the government was the most essential institution. You know, it's, it's the one that we can't do without. And, you know, he would go on like this. Um, but uh, while Hayek, you know, finds himself recommending vast, vast government interventions, his social theory presumes a kind of anarchism that you can read into it. At least, at least that's why I read Hayek. And I think we would be impoverished if we just, you know, dispensed with them all together, uh, I guess you could say. So. I should make that clear. Yes, I owe Hayek something. I did, I did say that. Um, I think... Um, Hayek, because he is as well known as he is, is for many, many people up to this day, that is also refers also to Friedman, uh, is the first step in, in the right direction. Um, I also said, and I emphasize it again, that I consider Hayek a, a very good economist. Uh, but I did not talk about his e contributions to economics I talked about those areas of his work that made him famous. Uh, there are very few people who actually read the economic treatises of Hayek. Um, I'm sure that the pure theory of capital by Hayek has been read by no more than two dozen people alive. Um, <laughs> and uh, this is by and large also true for other books like Prices and Production. I remember Friedman saying in some, uh, some uh, conference that he couldn't understand a word of Prices and Production. Um, so again, uh, my intention was not uh, to outlaw Hayek, so to speak. Uh, my, my intention was just to show that as a political theorist, he is a disaster. Um, and he can only be useful in the sense of opening the way for people who are on the search for something and they will encounter him long before they will encounter Rothbard or Mises. Uh, and uh, in so far, of course, he is of great use. Um, I know many people who experience the same thing that I experienced myself. They read Hayek first, and from then they marched on further and encountered better people, or at least better political theorists than Hayek. Thank you. A uh, question for Mr. Tucker. How do you feel about the, I must say, no offense, Benjamin, but the rather uh, silly remarks we just heard earlier that uh, we enjoy our own slavery and we enjoy the state oppression just so we can talk about it, and all of this is just uh, intellectual masturbation. Because to me, it sounded, uh, your speech earlier sounded like a, a call for resistance, at least on a very individual level. Thank you. So, uh, you, ask, you were asking a question to me, is that right? Oh, so I, I love Mencken. Uh, he's just a delight. Uh, but uh, he, his, his, uh, <clears throat> his pessimism was also I'm not entirely sure how serious it was. I think it was um, also an attempt to delight the, the reader. Um, 
uh, and I don't really share it in the sense that one, one of the things I think, think uh, Benjamin's paper left out and also Mencken left out is that statism doesn't work. This is a big problem for the state because it promises glorious things and they don't arrive. And, and yet people have to live their lives, you know? So, uh, so the, just, just because of the nature of things, there is a tendency for people to fly into resistance mode, even if they're not, you know, uh, outright Rothbardians or, you know, adopting Lockean and natural rights theory or whatever. They just want to have their clothes get cleaned or, or, or whatever the thing may be. So, yeah, there's always, every, every intensification of the state gives rise to more uh, of this Breaking Bad phenomenon, of this rebelliousness, of, this, of, the, of the pirate economy. And to me, this is a great source of hope. Um, I don't see Mencken really having dealt with this at all. I mean, even if you just walk down to the markets down the street here and walk through the central markets, you can see uh, the place is filled with pirate products everywhere. And it's just fantastic. I mean, it's glorious. I mean, it encourages you because it makes you realize, look, I mean, the U.S., the evil empire is, is, is going all around the world trying to crack down on piracy. And they can't do it. They can't get away with it. So the more rebellion we have, the more piracy we have, the more breaking bad that takes place in the world. And it's going to increase the larger the state intensifies its regulations, its taxations, and, and all of the, the terrible things it does, uh, the more we are able to create a kind of you know, sort of an underground civilization of, of liberty that's more efficacious and lends itself to human flourishing to, to a much greater extent than the official world. And eventually, I, I think we can, we can see a future in which, which the statist apparatus is absolutely overwhelmed and, and devoured by this world that we are creating as individuals and in all of our little micro uh, rebellions. Comment on that. Um. Uh, I mean, I think there's a, a very, uh, an almost total overlap between Breaking Bad and shit stirring, and uh, and just a point about Mencken's pessimism. Mostly, it's pretty rational looking at what's happened in the past and saying that will happen in the future. So it's not saying that uh, things will become unbearably bad and uh, government will uh, will uh, increase. Constantly saying, you know, there'll continue to be a fight and tension, um, but there's no reason to think that we'll make any progress. And so it's pretty rational just saying, look what's happened in the past, that will happen in the future. I mean, Mencken was you know, more famous than, like, than many of us, or all of us. You know, he was like the best known journalist in America. Uh, yet, you know, government kept on increasing. You know, that's just. Uh, that's just the way it goes. Uh, I must say, uh, I just want to say that there is quite a lot of fun to be derived from uh, government. I used to make a small income uh, from publishing in the New Statesman, which is a left-wing magazine in England, uh, the circulars that I used to receive in my hospital. I would just uh, publish them. And uh, with very little commentary, uh, very little commentary was required. And... Um, I've derived, uh, I've written quite a few articles on things. I, we, we received a, um, uh, in, in the hospital in which I worked, uh, we received a form saying that, asking us for our race, uh, religion, and sexual preferences in order that uh, the personnel department could continue to pay us correctly. And uh, there were, I think there were 17 races and 12 religions, or it might have been the other way around, I can't remember. And, um, and there were six sexual preferences. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, wrote, uh, sent them a little note saying, uh, surely you've got a very restricted imagination if you think there are only six. <laughs> And uh, so there is uh, quite a lot of fun <laughs> to be had from, uh, um, from uh, the idiocy of government, I must admit. I've, I've had a great deal of fun from it. <laughs> Don't you think, Benjamin, that part of what... <laughs> I, I perfectly agree with <laughs> what, Tom, what Tony just said. I also watch the TV and on these debates uh, uh, 
one smart guy talking to another smart guy being asked by a smart woman. I think this is just like a comedy show. Um, I also get great enjoyment out of just being able to predict what these guys will say <laughs> um, and what the counter arguments will be and how the whole debate will end. Um, so yesterday, I was, various people came and said, are you an optimist or are you a pessimist? I think it doesn't really matter. Um, I do what I like to do as long as they let me do it. Um, I, I hope that people will listen to me. Uh, if they don't listen to me, then I discontinue talking to them. Uh, and, uh, and I think uh, I'm, I'm happy with my life, uh, regardless of what will uh, come in the future, uh, as long, of course, as they don't incarcerate me. Um, but I'm in that regard, I'm optimistic that will likely <laughs> that will likely not happen. Uh, hi, I have a question for Benjamin uh, regarding Mencken and his pessimism. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think the page you created for Men Menger, well, sorry, Menke, Menken, uh, the Menken Info or something like that. That uh, on that side, the main picture is of Menken being very joyous after the end of prohibition. So my question to you is, 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 is what was Menger, Mencken's uh, reflections on the ending of the uh, prohibition, which was uh, obviously a great evil? So, so did he uh, felt uh, pessimistic afterwards that, or was he optimistic <laughs> in his writings? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, he was very active uh, during the calls for prohibition and during the introduction of prohibition. I think. I read somewhere that in the first 30 days of Prohibition, every day he wrote an article against it. Um, and, uh, you know, he would openly say that he's, you know, you know drinking bootleg whiskey or uh, whatever. And uh, definitely he was drinking all through Prohibition. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think it was just, uh, you know, he was happy. That was a minor victory. Um, but, you know, like there were still taxes on alcohol and, Plenty more. On, on prohibition, Mencken in his in his diaries, which is interesting, during prohibition, almost uh, almost every day he writes something on alcohol. He he doesn't write on that before and after prohibition, but during that time period, everybody was obviously obsessed about getting something to drink some some place and informing each other where they would go, where the good bars would be, where you would get this whiskey or that whiskey. None of that played any great role before or afterwards. So I think this also applies probably to drug prohibition. Um, if it would be legalized, these things, hardly anybody would talk about it. Hardly anybody would notice that they had been um, uh, permitted, um, but because of the fact that they are prohibited, uh, lots of people are simply obsessed by uh, getting drugs this type or that type or whatever it is. Uh, yeah, question for Hans. Uh, you, there's a very clear distinction uh, <clears throat> between illegitimate uh, force being the initiation of violence against personal property and legitimate right of defense. Um, under what circumstances, are there any circumstances in which preemptive attack is a legitimate force of defense, particularly if it's in response not to an overt but to a perceived threat, as was the case in Iraq and seems to be about the case in Iran? Those are, those are cases, I think, that have to be decided one by one. Um, uh, yes, things like that obviously exists where there is an impending attack uh, and, and you might react to this impending attack. But you obviously also realize immediately this, uh, that is a, a very dangerous concept because you can always come up with some impending attack from, uh, from someone and it would open the door to constant, to constant aggression. 
Um, and of course, every, uh, every war, or every major conflict that has broken out was fabricated in such a way that it looked like there was an impending attack or you even organized some small uh, skirmish, uh, paid the guys to do the skirmish, and then you had a, a reason uh, to do the invasion. So again, I think that requires very careful scrutinizing of the individual cases. In general, I tend to think uh, you, you, the, bur the burden of proof is on, on those who say there is an impending attack to show that that is really, really the case. Maybe, Stefan, uh, do you want to make a comment on, sure. on this thing? Uh, I agree with that that general uh, observation. And of course, in the case of states, the burden should be even higher. In a case of private defense, um, uh, maybe not quite as high. And then, of course, you could also argue that standing threats, which is a type of impending threat, someone who's proven by their previous actions they're just a complete menace to society, um, could be dealt with. I suspect that in a free society that uh, standing threats or impending threats like that would be dealt with somewhat procedurally by ostracism or something like that. Uh, but on occasion, you're going to have some, someone who's going to take law into their own hands if they don't see some progress being made. And they might uh, just take the guy out. And then thereafter, this guy might be viewed as sort of a little bit of a standing threat because he's not following the rules exactly. But on occasion, in egregious enough cases, you could see something li like that happening. But I think, by and large, it would be pretty rare to do it because the burden of proof would be high that you'd have to resort to. A question for Dr. Daniels, uh, if it's okay to, to go back and bring up a discussion from two days ago, I, I would love to hear the opinion of a successful author who went with a, a standard publisher on sort of the evolution of the publishing industry and, and what are the advantages and disadvantages of, of each, uh, each course. Um, well, I'm afraid your question is um, uh, based on a false premise that I'm successful. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as uh, somebody said, uh, uh, the, rare, my, the rare editions of my books are the second editions. And, uh, <laughs> 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 so, uh, I suppose that, uh, I've, of course, I've always gone through publishers. I've had great difficulty actually getting uh, uh, published in England uh, in up till fairly recently. Fortunately, the costs of publication have come down, and I had great difficulty in being published at all by any major publisher because I, I, I think genuinely it must have been for reasons that they didn't like uh, the content of what I wrote um, because... Uh, it was impossible that they would fail to make a profit from uh, my books. So I had great difficulty. Uh, I've always gone uh, through them. Um, I suppose in the modern world now they will act as some kind of filter or guarantee of some, this is, will be the, their claimed role, their, um, their um, uh, some kind of guarantee of uh, quality. In my case, of course, I, I, I don't think I need that anymore because there would be people, if I self-published, the, the uh, 612 people who buy my books uh, would probably buy them and I would cut out the uh, publisher. Um, I haven't really got anything uh, to say uh, other than uh, I continue to go through publishers because of inertia, mental laziness and inertia. Um, and, I, and of course, when you sell 612 copies, it doesn't really matter how you're published. It doesn't make much difference. Will you tell us 
how many copies you really sell? Was it not 613? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there, there have been books, I must admit, that I have sold. There are, some, there are a couple of books where I've sold 40,000 copies. But that's over a period of 10 years or something like that. So, or a book that's remained in... There are wonderful things for a publisher, uh, for, for someone like me now, that all the books that, um, uh, all the books that uh, I've written, which would never have been republished, are now being republished as Kindle editions. Uh, and presumably, so long as the, that continues, I will, uh, my books, which otherwise would have disappeared completely, will uh, go into the, uh, will be available forever. But unfortunately, that is true of everyone else's books. <laughs> <laughs> Any other I, questions? I don't really have anything uh, much to say um, on the subject. Hi, can I ask uh, Professor Hopper um, about Hayek? Why do you think he was so unsound? His, his main teacher was Mises, and yet he remains unsound and is ripe for plunder by social democrats. What, why was Hayek um, so mistaken? Thank you. His, his teacher, Mises, Mises was his teacher only as far as his economics is concerned. Um, and I think that is the area in which he excelled. Um, uh, his excursions into the area of political philosophy came much later in his life when he had been long separated from, from Mises and probably fell under the influence of other people. I personally do not know uh, who those people might have been. Um, um, but he, um, uh, he has, in, in the area of political philosophy, he displays a fundamental anti-rationalism. Um, he, he, he does not think that reason can accomplish very much. Um, but that, of course, he tries to reason. Um, so I think even there in his anti-rationalism, uh, constant talk against reasoning, uh, there is some sort of muddled mind at work. Um, because what is the purpose of writing, trying to persuade people uh, of his arguments unless he does trust uh, in reason. Otherwise, he should not say anything. Um, but I have, no, I have no answer to uh, why Mises did not have a greater influence on him also in the areas of political theory than, than he did. He, uh, I th if I may say, he was very interested in John Stuart Mill, wasn't he? And he edited the uh, letters of John Stuart Mill to his wife. Yes. Yeah. Uh, which might have turned his... Turned and John Stuart Mill was also a very muddled thinker. Uh, and his wife Harriet was an ardent socialist. Um, and that was the least of it. <laughs> <laughs> if you, if tell, you, tell me more. <laughs> Well, he was obviously a masochist, and uh, in the most literal uh, sense, and um, and uh, and she was extremely nasty to him, and he liked that. He liked that. Yeah. Maybe maybe a follow-up question to that isn't it right that uh, Hayek was converted by Mises's um, book Socialism, and pre pre previous to that he was a socialist. And isn't it the case that um, for many, not for all, but for many people who convert from socialism to s something else, they retain some, some form of socialism. The neoconservatives are ex-Trotskyites. Um, and so it may have been the case with Hayek. Is, is, is that but, then, but then Mises was a lefty himself also. Yes. And, as I said, and he, all, he converted himself to something entirely different. <laughs> Yes, uh, uh, not all were, uh, um, sorry, uh, some, of course, made the whole transition, like Mises, but 
for a lot of people, it is difficult. They want to keep something that tells them I was right in some way before. They don't want to dismiss themselves. Is that maybe the case? I think we should not engage in too much psychologizing. It's like, you see, I mean, we'll, I take Hayek at his word. I mean, this, this is what he writes, and I attack that or find it good or whatever it is. Why he did this or so. Um, Tony would be more qualified. He is a psychiatrist. Uh, I, I'm not a psychiatrist. I don't, I, I don't pretend to know what goes on in the minds of these people. All I see is the output on paper. Thank you. I have a question to you, Dr. Daniels. Um, you told us that uh, you consider people in the Western world to have a free lunch, uh, to live in a free lunch uh, society, to have a free lunch syndrome, if I quote you correctly, and that many people are rent seekers. Um, you as a psychiatrist, um, do you think that people are uh, mentally ready for freedom and liberty now? Uh, uh, well, there's that famous uh, quotation from uh, Macaulay who said, if you wait till people are ready to free for freedom before they're free, they're, they'll never be free. Um, there, it's certainly true that a lot of people don't like freedom, at least in our society. And uh, for example, to give you an example, uh, about, 30, about a third of the prisoners that I saw in prison um, uh, preferred life in prison to life outside. And, um, and that must be so, because in order to be caught by a British policeman, you must really make quite... <laughs> <laughs> you really have to uh, you know, beg him to arrest you and things. So, um, uh, and I used to take them aside and say confidentially, uh, do you like, you've been in prison several times before, do you like life in prison? And they would say yes. And the, re there were the reasons that they liked prison was that they wanted freedom actually from themselves. They didn't trust themselves. They also didn't want uh, women. It wasn't that they were homosexual, but their relations with, with women were so com conflict-ridden that it was a relief to be in prison where there were very few uh, women. So there are substantial numbers of people who don't want much in the way of freedom. And... Um, whether uh, what that means for society as a whole, I don't know. But these are people who have grown up in a, generally speaking, have grown up in a, a world without much structure, uh, without much love, and so on and so forth. And they actually find uh, more decency in prison than outside. It's a terrible thing. It's a terrible indictment, but, but that's how they are. Um, so I'm not sure what that means in a society of 60 million people in Britain, that there are many people who don't want uh, freedom. They definitely, uh, many, many do not want responsibility because it's very difficult. Responsibility is difficult. I have a question to um, Mr. Daniels. Um, the, uh, in the works of... Uh, Talking to the microphone. Yeah, okay. In the works of um, Socrates and also Hegel, if you might know, the, the main feature which is distinguishing human beings from animals is uh, timus, or timus, I don't know the spelling, is that the wish to be recognized and respected, and also for me it means an opportunity of making a choice. And this is something, the democracy, I would say, is um, an idea, or uh, it's that is making an illusion of being respected, recognized, and having a choice. So I would say that it's rather um, the, the, cho the illusory choice without consequences. And this is exactly where I see the weakest point of the whole construction where um, the, the most enormous changes could be made. Yeah, I, I I'm not quite sure what the, the, my question, the question is. Yeah, my, my question is that it is in the very nature of the human being to seek for being recognized and heard and uh, respected. So I would say that there is a big chance of um, pushing on that exactly point and uh, change the attitude to the whole political system as well. 
Well, I, I suppose it, me it depends whether you mean uh, one is self, uh, self-consciously looking for respect or, or, or whether uh, it's a, an inherent thing that you want it. The idea of self-consciously looking for respect is, is disastrous because, in my view, it ends up in intimidation. You will give me respect or otherwise. I mean, that's what respect has come to mean in, in the areas where I practiced, for example. Respect meant you will do what I do, what I want, or you will cringe before me because if you don't, I will be violent towards you. That's what respect meant. That's what recognition meant for them. And the other thing of, uh, I mean, self-esteem is another dreadful quality. Um, people would come to me and say, I, I have no self-esteem. And I'd say, well, at least you've got one thing right. <laughs> <laughs> and, the str- <laughs> and the strange thing is, instead of beca- <laughs> becoming very angry, they started laughing beca- <laughs> because they knew the whole concept was bogus. The, the, there's a huge difference between self-esteem and self-respect. And self-respect is what it has, is, and self-respect is a very valuable quality because it's a social quality and so on. Self-esteem is actually saying, I love myself, whatever that actually means, I, or I like myself, irrespective of what I actually am or what I do or what I mean to other people. And unfortunately, that kind of uh, thinking has uh, probably become very widespread. Talking about self-esteem, Tony, are you familiar with Nathaniel Brandon, for whom self-esteem is the highest goal in life? <laughs> um, uh, well, I pity him. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Hülsmann recently had an excellent lecture on exactly on the argument of the relationship between Mises and his nasty students. Uh, so um, I would very much uh, like that you give us a synthesis of what you said in your lecture in Prague. I think it could be interesting for our debate on Hayek and, and, and Mises. The lecture in, uh, in Prague, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> I try, try to be brief. Yeah, the, the lecture uh, uh, concerned um, uh, the, the role that Mises played in the, the Mont Pelerin Society. Actually, that was a talk that I gave here in the, in the Property and Freedom Society six years ago. And so a variant of this, I did this in Prague because it's still not published. So that's what academics do. If you don't have much time, you're just given the same talk or a variant thereof a second time, because it's not yet published. So uh, in, in that uh, lecture, I explained that uh, uh, Mises was very skeptical uh, concerning the uh, future evolution of the Mont Pelerin Society because it was infused with social uh, democrats, in particular, Willem Röpke. But maybe he also thought of Hayek. Uh, Hayek had not yet published the Constitution of Liberty. So he said, well, if we, we start from the outset, we're discussing whether the income tax should be 25% or 30%, I and mean, that cannot be the, uh, the point of a libertarian congregation. So learning from this was precisely one of the reasons why Hans Hoppe uh, took the initiative a few years back to, in order to set up uh, this society in which we would not spend our time on uh, scheming out the, the best way uh, interventionist policies could be arranged, but set out in completely free from such constraints discussing all uh, fundamental uh, questions pertaining to uh, liberty and the unnecessary uh, nature of the government and try to have fun doing this. Yeah, thank you.